All right, folks, it's probably time to start. Um, so uh, I'm Greg Elkenbard. I work for Mirantis. Uh, we are an OpenStack um, distribution provider and OpenStack services provider uh, company. And uh, this speech uh, covers a few of our experiences in deploying OpenStack uh, in various environments, specifically focusing on uh, various hypervisor technologies in OpenStack. So does the hypervisor matter in OpenStack? Well, it does, but let's see how. Um, OK, so uh, in this talk, I'll cover uh, the brief history of, um, at least from our point of view, of uh, what, are, what are the hypervisors in the, uh, that we've seen, um, uh, uh, cover the trends that are emerging uh, in various segments where we deploy OpenStack, um, and discuss the opportunities and challenges for multi-hypervisor environment. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Probably not the very beginning, but uh, close enough. Um, in 2011, uh, we uh, primarily did Zen-based deployments uh, with a little bit of KVM. Uh, Zen was a very popular choice, mostly due to its selection by Rackspace and Amazon. Uh, people just looked around and said, okay, let's just do Zen. Uh, so, but in 2012, the picture actually changed, um, and uh, KVM has overtaken um, Zen uh, in the number of deployments that we have done. Uh, a lot of it is political, uh, so Citrix's uh, support for alternative cloud technology and its waffling around OpenStack didn't endear too many people, so people will confuse whether they will or will not. Uh, go forward with it. Uh, a lot of it was just KVM was maturing and evolving a lot faster than the non-commercial version of Zen. Uh, okay, coming forward in 2013. Um, this is the picture for this year. Uh, so KVM is still a very, very huge uh, percentage of our uh, OpenStack deployments and requests for OpenStack deployments. Uh, VMware actually surprisingly has emerged as number two um, in the hypervisor race. Uh, well, perhaps not so surprising. Uh, OpenStack right now is penetrating the enterprise market where VMware has a very, very heavy presence and people are considering about how to utilize their existing infrastructure. Uh, by the way, folks, uh, these slides have been uploaded. Uh, to save you the trouble of taking a picture of every single slide, you can just go to the website. Uh, but, but feel free, uh, feel free to take the picture. Um, all right. Uh, so, um, not in the deployment picture, but a very popular request item is for containers. Uh, there's various containers and uh, technologies that we've been asked for, Lexi, Parallels, Docker, a um, few of the other ones. Um, they're primarily coming in from the web hosting and the SaaS segments. Not surprisingly, in these segments, uh, you either need to run hundreds or thousands of individual guests, something that regular heavyweight hypervisor, uh, hypervisors cannot really do, uh, or the SaaS focused where the uh, application itself has the multi-tenancy hooks and, and does not need uh, the infrastructure to provide multi-tenancy. Uh, we do get, uh, we got one request for Zen this year and um, the only request for Hyper-V we got is because of the Microsoft licensing issues. Uh, we explained to people how to bypass them so the request went away. Uh, so essentially, uh, what you do is Microsoft uh, will support Microsoft uh, stuff on, uh, hype, on commercial hypervisors, such as commercial version of KVM on RHEL and things like that. Um, and we use server aggregates to limit the Microsoft deployments so you don't have to overpay for licenses. So that's essentially how it works. Um, uh, Hyper-V is still there. It's probably uh, going to increase um, as OpenStack uh, um, user base broadens out. Uh, but right now, it's not really that large uh, of a market for us. All right, so um, I noticed, uh, since um, I've been doing a lot of these, I noticed a few trends emerging, just wanted to document them out. Uh, so the telco and the ISP segment uh, uh, is usually a single hypervisor. They want a relatively simple infrastructure. Um, and KVM there is emerging uh, as a choice um, uh, for the hypervisor technology. Um, Internet-focused companies, uh, mostly internet startups, a lot of the social companies and everything else. Uh, there's also a single hypervisor, they're also KVM. Um, so the sub-segment of that is the web hosting and the SaaS guys. Uh, and there, 
we do see some multi-hypervisor technology. Essentially what they want to do is they want to run KVM and uh, Docker or KVM and Lexi. Um, and in the web hosting se segment, LXC is still uh, the leading uh, choice for the hypervisor technology. I mean, some of them don't bother with virtualization, just use um, Apache uh, to provide uh, just virtual hosting containers, but uh, a lot of other people are running LXE. Um, on the enterprise side, uh, it's definitely multi-hypervisor. Uh, almost everybody is asking us to deploy multiple hypervisor technologies. Uh, and their uh, KVM, uh, so they have an existing vCenter ESXi deployment and their KVM is coming in as just an extra addition to their existing enterprise virtualization uh, structure. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah. opportunities and challenges uh, of creating a multi-hypervisor um, use case. So we'll talk about various use cases and advantages of issues uh, of a few of the hypervisors. So, use cases. Uh, well, you have an existing virtualization infrastructure, uh, and what you would like to do is you would like to extend it rather than replace it completely. Um, that, that means that you have maybe a VMware or a Zen-based deployment or even a KVM deployment, um, and you wanna deploy it with a second hypervisor, but yet provide a common set of APIs uh, so that your internally developed applications or your portals uh, uh, do not have to be modified um, in order to support a multi-hypervisor environment. Um, and surprisingly now, uh, some of the portal technologies are writing to the OpenStack APIs and are not writing uh, to the VMware APIs. So uh, we've been asked to deploy OpenStack uh, just so uh, people can control their VMware environment using their portal. Um, so to some degree it's also to hedge the bets against bugs. Hypervisors do have bugs, surprisingly enough. Um, and uh, it's also to hedge the bets against vendor pricing, right? So if you have both hypervisors running your environment and you've uh, developed a migration strategy between, uh, of workloads between the hypervisors, then uh, if one of them becomes a little too expensive, you can come to the vendor and say, listen, um, it'll be a five minute operation for us to move the workload, let's negotiate. Um, uh, and to some degree, it's utilized some of the additional features. Uh, so for example, uh, if you deploy using vCenter, you can still enjoy DRS, you can still enjoy storage remotion, a few of the things that OpenStack still doesn't support, right? All right, so let's cover the hypervisors in a little bit of detail. So KVM, uh, like I mentioned before, KVM is a very, very large base for us. It's uh, about 90% of the requests, 95% of active deployments uh, this year are on KVM. Um, it's a type two hypervisor, which means it relies on a distro to provide a lot of its services. Um, it is relatively easy to add new devices to support new features because it, the way of it's structured. Um, and it, uh, it's relatively easy to tune it to get decent performance numbers. Um, so we focus on few of the areas, but both uh, uh, myself and the chief architect of Mirantis are working heavily in the um, HPC and network function virtualization arena where the networking has to be relatively low latency and the networking has to be fast. So we've done a bit of research of what technologies exist there and we'll cover it a little bit in the next few slides. Go ahead. Uh, you do not have tool, but what we do as part of our deployment practice will provide you a set of recommendations of how it will be tuned. And our fuel uh, deployment tool will do most of the basic tunings out of the box. Uh, fuel can do most of them out of the box, uh, but the list of possible uh, tunings uh, is fairly large. So we'll supply you a wider list of what you can do for specific use cases. Sure. Uh, so Fuel doesn't really support application types. Uh, what you do is you can tune for specific network performance. So if you need high performance networking in large packets, it can do that. If you need to conserve memory, uh, we'll provide you a recommendation how to do that and things like that. So we have not bothered to develop application profiles uh, because right now, there's probably 100 or 200 different applications that people brought to us that people use this for. 
So the universe is a little large, so what we have is, okay, here's the, uh, here's the HPC profile. Here's what you do to get your storage, your compute, and your networking working correctly in the HPC case. Here's the NFV profile. So let's say you want to virtualize network functions. You need to tune uh, extensively for the network. You can afford to spend a little bit more on CPU. You can afford to spend a little bit more memory, but your networking has to be dead on. So we'll give you that profile and things like that. So we developed it as part of our practice. Like I said, few will do just the basics. So if you install it and you have a generic multi-use case, you don't need anything else. But if you have specialized use cases, we've done enough of them. Uh, that we've captured the recommendations from the various vendors, we'll put them together, and we'll present them to you. Or actually, if we do them, uh, we'll just do that for you as part of our deployment. So when we do the deployment, we just figure out what is your use case, we document it, and we'll just tune it for you. All right, uh, so getting back to the slides. So the flexibility of uh, KVM um, allows you to um, do interesting things to it. Uh, one of those examples is the Mellanox E-switch, uh, where Mellanox decided to uh, replace a virtual switch with a piece of silicon, uh, realizing substantial speed-ups. You guys will see it on the next page. Uh, or the work that Intel has done to uh, marry its DK toolkit uh, with the uh, Open vSwitch infrastructure to gain substantial performance in the networking. Um, there are a few issues with KVM. We'll cover it in the following pages. Most of them are related to specific distro issues. All right, uh, so uh, we do use KVM both for HPC and uh, network function virtualization use cases. It does work well in those. Uh, there is extensive set of tunings available. It's probably about three or four pages worth. I didn't wanna create them all in the slides, but the, the basic ones are all here. Um, so set the bias to max performance. Uh, uh, do not try to save energy by letting the computer manage your CPU speed. Uh, you'll wind up with a fair, fair amount of jitter. Uh, so yes, do enable turbo, uh, but uh, shut off just about everything else. Um, enable huge pages, uh, uh, and um, there is some recommendations uh, that uh, requires you to wire them uh, down. Uh, on rel, uh, when you set up the rel box, you tune the server itself for virtualization, or we will do it for you when we do the setup. Uh, libvirt, uh, you configure the pass-through flags. You should not use virtualized CPUs. Um, and uh, increase the TCP buffers, processor queue, and stuff like that. Um, congestion, default con congestion control mechanism in uh, TCP on most of the distros should be uh, replaced with um, HTCP. Um, and please enable Jumbo frames, uh, especially for the HPC workloads. Uh, they will benefit you a lot. Uh, all right, so some of the performance results uh, for KVM. Uh, without anything special, uh, just with those basic tunings, on Jumbo frames, uh, we can get roughly seven to eight uh, gigabits per second. Um, so that's your typical HPC workload uh, where uh, fairly large data sets have, be, have to be exchanged. Obviously, with the small packets, the performance will drop down to a few gigabits per second. Uh, oh, this is obviously a 10 gig interface. We do very few one gig work nowadays. Uh, most of our customers run 10 gig. Uh, so now, interesting thing, just dropping in the Mellanox card, uh, nothing else, uh, gets you to about 23 gigabits per second. Um, you'll see that for VM to VM case, you're already starting to saturate the host. Uh, the CPU on the host, the kernel can process things, the system can time slice things. But if you wanna talk between the host and the between uh, two different machines, uh, uh, you get 23 gigabits per second. And we didn't even try to tune anything. This is just, we dropped the card in, activated it based on default Mellanox instructions, and off we go into uh, multiple 10 gigabit land. Um, so interesting work has been done by Intel. Um, Intel has taken its uh, uh, DPDK data processing kit, which essentially has a lockless kernel, which has uh, mostly zero copy IO, and integrated with the vSwitch protocol. They've also uh, done some hooks uh, in the guest uh, for um, either um, shared memory uh, or replacing traditional socket applications. Um, and um, this is an alternative uh, to what you can do if you don't want to replace your hardware, we'll say like, like Mellanox uh, or some other um, on-chip switch. Um, and uh, with very small packets, would normally would be around two, one to two gigabits per second, uh, you can get up to seven. Uh, and uh, once you get to the average packet size, uh, you get pretty much wire speed. 
Uh, so that's great work. Um, Intel is working with Wind River, Ericsson, and a few others. This, these performance notes have been shamelessly cribbed from the Ericsson paper. Uh, so, uh, uh, and this work is ongoing. Uh, the switch right now is in prototype stage, but the Intel um, is, uh, and its various partners is working on making a production reality. Uh, now, uh, this is, these performance numbers are without uh, the DPDK uh, based uh, guests. With the DPDK best based guests, you can actually increase this even further. But then you'll have to use the uh, shared memory. Now, obviously, if you're going to be using the shared memory right now, the Intel's DPDK switch um, is insecure. The shared memory segments are shared between multiple VMs. So this is mostly for uh, your service provider. You want to run virtual switches or virtual routers. Uh, all of your VMs uh, belong to a single tenant. So it's not so much about security segregation. Uh, it's more about work workload isolation between your VMs. So then you can use this switch. All right, so KVM features and issues. Well, it has uh, one of the widest uh, sets of OpenStack features. You guys can go read the matrix. I'm not gonna rehash it here. I think the only one that doesn't support is set administrative password, which I think only Zen supports at this moment. moment. Uh, some of the issues that we have run into it. Uh, so there is a bit of a difficulty of uh, transferring images uh, from other hypervisors. Um, you have to redo the drivers. Uh, so migrating from VMware, migrating from Hyper-V is somewhat painful. Uh, there, we've actually developed the process. Uh, Red Hat has a relatively nice tool chain to migrate from VMware, and we identify the set of service partners. Uh, so if somebody needs to migrate uh, the workload from an alternative hypervisor, we can enable that. Um, uh, so now, uh, back again to the driver issue. Uh, so this is mostly distro related, right? Th this works pretty well in Ubuntu, but in the older uh, RHEL and CentOS distributions, the, Q the version of QMU is a little old. It doesn't support the um, uh, SCSI drivers. Uh, it only supports the Vert IO drivers. Uh, so that means that you have to replace your existing drivers uh, with the Vert IO package. Um, that's, so you need to update your images moving between the hypervisors. Uh, we've actually uh, worked around that issue for people who need it. So in the Mirantis distro, we will ship an upstream version of QMU uh, that bypasses this problem. Um, okay, so um, like, uh, VMware ESXi. Uh, VMware ESXi is actually gaining steam as uh, a relatively popular platform uh, for deploying OpenStack. Uh, now, uh, both uh, vCenter-based APIs and just regular uh, simple hypervisor APIs are supported, but all of our requests up to date have been vCenter. So we've done, we, we've done the test deployment on the SXI, but everybody, all of the commercial environments, they, they simply want to be able to take the existing vCenter clusters, wire them to OpenStack, uh, combine them with KVM and maybe something else, and uh, run through a portal, and off you go. Uh, right, so ESXi is a type one hypervisor. It does not need a distro to operate, but that means that VMware controls all of the bits and pieces. The code has to be signed. That means nobody can just drop a random uh, vSwitch into it that VMware doesn't like or something else. So you have to go talk to VMware to extend the ESXi. Uh, so like I mentioned before, uh, VMware supports both ESXi and the vCenter APIs in their driver. Uh, they're actively maintaining their, their driver. Uh, so a little bit brief of funny history, actually Citrix was the first guys who put the VMware support into OpenStack, but VMware has realized that this is a good thing, taken over this, and is very actively, as you'll see in the follow-on pages, driving the deployment of this. Uh, all right, so OpenStack compatibility. It has fairly decent compatibility, missing few light things, uh, pause, unpause, and resize, but otherwise uh, it's pretty good. Uh, Obviously, our deployments up to this point have been done on Grizzly, although future ones will be done on Havana. Um, so here's the issues that we've identified. Uh, so if you want to deploy with Nova Networks, there is no security group integration, right? So that means that um, you're not going to be able to use your security groups, which is annoying, um, and most commercial deployments want it. So that's why uh, most of them actually have to buy Nisera. So this is one way for VMware to co-sell their products. Eh, it's a reasonable choice for a commercial company. 
Uh, so if you plan to deploy VMware and KVM mixed environment, you need to plan on buying new serial licenses, right? So uh, you need to buy new serial NVP or the NSX product, um, and you'll be deploying that alongside of your existing OpenStack infrastructure. Uh, now, uh, while uh, Nisera NVP is currently not yet part of automatic fuel deployment, we can relatively easily deploy it post fat. So we'll deploy everything else using fuel uh, with the OBS plugin, then we'll switch it out for Nisera NVP uh, before giving it to the end user. All right, uh, so Glance integration is relatively inefficient. Uh, it does not integrate with the templating agent uh, in uh, uh, VMware, which means that you still have to copy your images in and out of Glance. It, it will be more efficient, and VMware has committed to do this for Icehouse. There's a blueprint outstanding of uh, integrating both of these uh, functionality. Uh, in Grizzly, only single data store was supported, just the first one. So if you had multiple data stores defined, you can, could not use uh, the other ones. Uh, with the Cinder, only iSCSI type volumes were supported. So you can do VMDK-based data stores and stuff like that. Um, and only linked clones were supported, not full clones. Uh, all right, so like I said before, VMware is active, very actively working on this driver in Havana and has extended it with lots and lots of features. I've captured just a few of them. I didn't want to bore you with the pages. Uh, so now linked and full clones are supported. You can actually specify which one you want. Uh, multiple um, vCenter clusters uh, are now can be managed by a single driver. So it's actually, uh, so within a single uh, vCenter cluster, you can set up multiple pools, and each pool can be independently managed by the OpenStack driver. It now understands that the vCenter is not a single hypervisor, it's a collection of resources. That's a very important fix that VMware has put in. It makes it much, much more useful. Um, Okay, so there's now support for config drives, so if you don't have your metadata service working, you can, uh, you can push an ISO up there with uh, properties. Uh, there's finally uh, Cinder support for VMDK-based volumes, so you can do file-based stuff. So the interesting thing is that you can now go ahead and let's say you have some SAN-based storage, which is not yet supported by OpenStack because OpenStack is mostly iSCSI and the FC support is a little lagging. You can wire it into your VMware uh, and just use that for your VMDK store, and now you'll be able to create Cinder volumes using your VMDK store. And using your, whatever your favorite SAN provider, and their names are mentioned, that is, hasn't bothered yet to put in the drivers into OpenStack. Uh, VMware's commercial storage support is a little bit more extensive than Cinder is right now. Uh, you can now use the vShield um, Edge uh, device uh, uh, for MVP, so you have support for firewall as a service and load balancer as a service uh, using VMware's products. So it's kind of nice, uh, not that many people uh, have gotten the LBAS drivers working except for F5, uh, so it's nice for these guys to jump in and uh, get their stuff to work. Um, all right, uh, so networking. I like networking. That's my focus, so uh, I decided to put on a slide uh, about networking. Uh, so obviously the default choice is the Nisera MVP NSX products, right? So the NSX is just the extension that supports some uh, VMware-specific stuff, so you can either use NSX or the MVP. Uh, um, and uh, there is Cisco uh, 1KV coming. Um, um, the multi-hypervisor support is going to be released sometime. Uh, uh, in the future, it's already in public beta, so you can ask Cisco and it'll enable it you. And uh, obviously, the 1KV for um, uh, ESXi platform has been available for quite a long time. So this is an alternative if you have an old Cisco infrastructure uh, that allows you to extend your virtual switching um, uh, uh, all the way to the server edge. Uh, okay, so accelerated options. Well, obviously, since the VMware controls all of the bits and pieces, you can't just drop in a Mellanox driver. But what you can do is you can use the MVP um, using STT. STT uh, uses TCP-based encapsulation. It can actually use um, the LSO engine on most uh, server NIC drivers to get wire speed. So you can get 10 gig wire speed uh, relatively easily uh, using the SERA and STT-based uh, workloads. Um, and uh, Cisco has actually developed and pu uh, published a white paper of how you can use Cisco's hardware to accelerate your networking as well. 
so the key to it is uh, Cisco has developed the VN tag protocol, uh, which uh, is supported by a number of players. Uh, but in this case, what you do is you use a combination of VN tag uh, with the SRIV. Um, so you present virtual NICs uh, to your uh, VM guests and you let your switches manage all of your switching. Uh, so that means that uh, all of the packets are hairpinned, but that's actually not that bad um, of a deal because most of the folks we found run anti-affinity. Very few VMs talk to uh, fellow VMs. We had few people who wanted to optimize and have an extremely low latency application traffic, but 90% of the use cases out there are anti-affinity. They want to run on different hosts for application resiliency and for other use cases. So the amount of traffic that actually has to happen is relatively minimal. Uh, so the combination of the Cisco switches, and Cisco calls this technology VM fabric extension protocol, uh, allows you to essentially replace uh, your virtual switch uh, with Cisco gear and get 10 gig wire speed. All right, so uh, containers. Uh, last hypervisor technology we'll be talking uh, around here. Now, uh, containers is a growing topic for us. Uh, it's in a lot of the requests, uh, but uh, we haven't done any container deployments yet, honestly, uh, for various reasons. Number one is technology is a little iffy, uh, and for us to finish it up would require a, a relatively large uh, price, most people who are running containers are not willing to pay that for us to get the technology to the level where they needed it. Um, so uh, where do you use containers? Well, you use containers where you have hundreds of thousands of guests that you need to run in very, very lightweight things. Uh, when all of the apps belong to a single tenant, so you don't need secure segregation between your applications. Uh, although there is work in place uh, to get the containers actually to be more secure with SC Linux and App Armor style tools. So uh, containers are going to become more and more secure um, in the future. Uh, all right, uh, the space itself is a little fragmented. We've got requests for Lexi. Lexi is probably the most popular container technology um, out there. Uh, we have the requests for Parallels which unfortunately is lacking uh, the uh, OpenStack driver at this moment. Uh, and we have requests for Docker, which is the new uh, application container distribution um, based on, loosely based on Lexi. Uh, so there is limited OpenStack support, but there's a lot of interest. So uh, Mirantis is going to invest in the space a little bit. So for Icehouse, uh, you'll see some developments in this area. Uh, now, Docker guys also got a bunch of money, and uh, they're um, actively driving their driver to accelerate uh, acceptance of containers when there's an OpenStack community. So um, uh, I'm going to cover Lexi instead of Docker. Uh, like I said, right now, Lexi is probably the most popular request we get right now. Uh, so on VM, only uh, launch, reboot, and terminate are supported. Uh, no other operations are supported. Networking. Um, it's possible to get basic VLANs working, so uh, we have uh, uh, the instructions necessary in order to get ne Neutron OVS working itself, uh, but it's a little hard. It's not supported out of the box. Um, and then officially there is no Cinder support, um, although the xCloud guys have gotten the Cinder driver to work, uh, so the recipe is available. Uh, so you can, uh, if you're willing to hack around, you can get volume supported with uh, Lexi as well. All right, so that's about it for the presentation. Uh, questions? Can you repeat what you said about the uh, security issues in uh, when you run Linux containers? Well, uh, when you run Linux containers, the container technology simply runs a single kernel, right? So if you hack your kernel, you've now penetrated the, uh, your fellow guests, right? So you can now start looking at their memory. Uh, so what people usually do, uh, it's a lot easier, so there's thousands of Linux uh, kernel bugs that allow you to exploit the Linux kernel uh, and hack it, and there's only maybe 50, 60 hypervisor-based bugs. So it's substantially harder to hack the hypervisors, although my hacker friends tell me they can break any hypervisor in five minutes. Uh, so I bought them enough beers that I actually trust them on that. Uh, but uh, I haven't bothered to follow it up. Now, I do know that uh, there is 
roughly, uh, in the last years, there's roughly 45, 50 uh, penetration bugs that were, um, uh, that were recorded against KVM and QMU. A uh, little bit less uh, than, than the Zen and half that number on ESXi. No open source, so people find it a little harder to hack. Most of the KVM exploits were based around QMU uh, and uh, shared I.O. processing. 70% uh, of those exploits were actually uh, denial of service attacks. So let's crash the machine. Uh, so, and 30% of them were, oh, I'm actually able to start messing around with the memory pages and remap somebody else's memory into mine and start viewing data. Uh, so those were dangerous. They're actually very, uh, so the vendors are really relatively proactive about closing them, but you never know if there's an old version, non-patched, running around somewhere. So they're hypervisor exploits. Now on KVM, what we do is if people ask us for security, we routinely deploy SE Linux uh, to separate the QMU processes from each other uh, and make sure that if the process on one gets broken, that you at least can't start messing around with your general Linux distribution. Uh, so uh, it's possible to do the same thing, same thing technology as to Linux and AppArmor uh, on the containers, but it's a lot harder to contain the damage, right? So Linux kernel is very, relatively easily hacked. A script, uh, it doesn't require much intelligence. ScriptKitties can go hack it, right? Uh, especially most distros use an uh, older version of the kernel. They haven't, uh, some people don't really religiously update their patches and things like that. So it's just a lot easier to penetrate the containers. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, there's less processor isolation, memory isolation. Uh, so there's, uh, there is less isolation between the guests in the workload as well. Uh, do we see any issues with Zen? We simply don't see Zen anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, God's honest truth. We got one request for Zen this year. One, just one. Uh, so uh, it's a great hypervisor. Citrix is investing in technology. Uh, so it's just in the markets where we're going to, uh, the, uh, it's a duopoly between uh, uh, Red Hat KVM and uh, ESXi based VMware uh, hypervisors. Uh, Zen is just not in those. Uh, a lot of the uh, places where it's used uh, is in the desktop virtualization technologies. Uh, these are still relatively immature on KVM. Uh, so Citrix, uh, uh, Citrix desktop virtualization and VMware's desktop virtualization is actually very, very superior. And that's the only place where we see Zen nowadays. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, Citrix guys can give you uh, references with Zen. Uh, actually, Zen has a lot of support. Uh, it's a tier one hypervisor, uh, which means that absolutely everything in OpenStack works. Uh, but Citrix would like for you to buy the commercial Zen, right? So instead of the open source one. Uh, we actually built our first pre-OpenStack cloud in 2010. We built our own IS. We built it around Zen and open vSwitch. But uh, that was in 2010. This is 2013. Go ahead. Uh, yes, you do. Uh, we, by default, use uh, kernel I.O. and virtual I.O. Uh, to improve performance. So those seven to eight, uh, uh, seven to eight uh, gigabits on uh, non-accelerated figures, we're using vert I.O. Yep, uh, it's, uh, okay, so the deal there is uh, uh, this was a relatively low power host. Your CP, uh, the CPUs and the kernel locking on both of the machines is beginning to saturate a little bit. Uh, it's 23, yeah. Uh, because you can use all of the, so we give, uh, to, get to, uh, to get to 23, so your VM is going to become CPU bound, processing this much power. Remember that this is a user level application in a VM uh, talking to another user level application in another VM, right? So you need to use up a lot of CPU to send 23 gigabits worth of packets. So in that use case, we're, give, we're, we're given the VM the entire eight cores of the machine. And in the other use case, we actually have to split the cores between the two VMs. So performance went down. So Mellanox actually, uh, uh, we didn't bother optimizing it or anything else, running it in larger machines. It's what we got, right, uh, preparing for the summit. So 
Uh, Mellanox actually has a use case that's showing significant performance uh, locally uh, and remotely. They have uh, a large number of optimizations uh, written into their manual uh, that we did not bother to applying in this use case. We just threw a quick test together. We had a spare Mellanox card and a couple spell servers and said, okay, let's do some performance testing. Uh, my apologies, there's a little, it's a little background noise. If you can speak up. Uh, so yes, correct. So uh, our routine, uh, so our routine recommendation is to enable all possible offloads that your driver supports. Uh, so uh, most of this is done with the checksum offload, large segment set offload. Like I said before, LSO actually accelerates STT. Uh, and uh, you can use the 10 gig toes in order to get the maximum performance possible. Uh, okay, you run into some weird edge case bug in your driver. Um, interesting. Um, so uh, we haven't had any problems with uh, the uh, LRO, uh, but uh, uh, sorry, LSO, right? Uh, oh, la large what? Oh, LRO. No, we use LSO. We use LSO. We activate LSO, a large segment of load, not LRO. My apologies. Um, right, uh, yeah, that looks like there is just a bug uh, in the Intel driver for that particular chipset. Uh, like I said before, we don't really, uh, we enable the LSO engine uh, on the toes, or a full toe. So if you have a full chimney compliant toe uh, and you're activated, that actually should work. Um, so we haven't had any particular issues with either the Broadcoms uh, or the Intels. Uh, I think both of them work reasonably equally well. Um, obviously, the Intel DBDK uh, will only come for the drivers for the Intel part, so that may limit your choices if you wanted to use the Intel technology. Now, it's easy enough to actually add drivers to DPDK. We actually added Broadcom drivers for something else we're doing to uh, the DPDK toolkit for, for uh, the Broadcom, but you, ha you would have to do it. Uh, it wouldn't come out of the box. Uh, okay, so uh, with VMware itself, um, okay, uh, so what I would do, uh, what I would do is um, I would uh, set up boot from volume. Uh, Cinder does have ability to specify storage class. It's a simple tag, uh, it's not hierarchical, uh, but you should be able to request what volume type your volume should be located in for booting, uh, right? So when you create a volume, you can specify an appropriate storage type, then you'll be able to boot off that volume and gain the advantage of your fast storage. Yeah, yes. 
Uh, no, that does not introduce latency. Syndra is just a control path. Syndra is not involved in the data path. Uh, you're simply using iSCSI uh, to get your packets in and out. Syndra just sets up the volume. Uh, in the KVM implementation, the volume is actually mounted into the kernel uh, using your iSCSI driver and exposed out to the hypervisor as a block device. Um, I'm sure in the ESXi implementation it works similar. So Syndra is not a data path thing. It's only control path. So now, uh, obviously booting from volume uh, across the network link may have some latency, right? Associated with just booting from volume, but most of the VMware environments already want you to use, it's around blades, and they want you to use external storage anyways. So you already paid the penalty for going to the external storage. Uh, using Cinder will add no penalty to that environment. Go ahead, please. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so, well, uh, most of the time when you go going to boot from volume, uh, you're not going to be booting from some local disk. Uh, you're going to be booting off a SAN, uh, right? So, or you're going to be booting off a dedicated cluster based on commodity hardware. Now, I know Nutanix, few other companies are going to the conver hyper-converged, and we actually have done environments where each node was a Cinder host, uh, Cinder, Cinder volume host, and was exporting its local storage as a Cinder volume. We've also done environments where each node was a Ceph host and was running compute resources. Those are done as one-offs. They're not very popular. Most of the VMware or most of the other deployments that are going to the volume will be going to NetApp or AMC or some large commercial frame. 